Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. A slower week for hardware news, but there's still a few interesting bits and pieces to go through. Plus, I'll go into a few rumors and leaks at the end. So let's get straight into it. The biggest hardware news story out of this week concerns memory, specifically GDDR6. Micron has announced they have begun mass producing GDDR6 memory, joining both Samsung and SK Hynix as producers of the new memory. This completes the trifecta of major memory manufacturers producing GDDR6, so there should be plenty of supply for next generation graphics cards, especially from a certain green company. Micron's GDDR6 options for the graphics market are simple. OEMs can either choose from 12 gigabit per second or 14 gigabit per second chips at 1.35 volts with 8 gigabit capacities. GDDR5 typically operated at 1.5 to 1.6 volts and topped out at 9 gigabit per second speeds in the best bins. So the top 14 gigabit per second variant of GDDR6 provides more than 50% more bandwidth with lower power consumption. Even 12 gigabit per second GDDR6 will provide 50% more bandwidth than the widely used 8 gigabit per second GDDR5. GDDR6 will also supersede GDDR5X, which didn't really achieve wide adoption outside of a few high-end NVIDIA GPUs. GDDR5X topped out at 11 gigabit per second in those GPUs, so 14 gigabit per second GDDR6 will again give OEMs about 27% more bandwidth to play with. And there's plenty of room to grow there. 16 gigabit per second chips are coming to match Samsung's announced 16 gigabit per second GDDR6 at 1.35 volts. Micron has also managed to get GDDR6 up to 20 gigabit per second in their labs, so we should be able to see generational improvements throughout the lifespan of GDDR6 memory. It's practically a certainty at this point that new GPUs will use GDDR6 memory, so when Nvidia finally gets Gets around to announcing them, we should be seeing a nice bump to memory bandwidth without having to tap into extremely expensive HBM2. We're approaching the launch of AMD's second generation Threadripper CPU, so it only makes sense that prices for first gen Threadripper are hitting all time lows. With second gen so close to launch and the prospect of an entirely refreshed lineup with new 32 core and 24 core parts, for those that like cutting edge technology, it's probably not the best idea to jump in now and buy a Threadripper CPU, but the latest price for the top end 16 core 1950X in particular are quite tasty for those that want a bargain. As spotted by Tech Power Up, European prices for Threadripper have dropped in the past few days, with the 1950X sitting below 650 euros at the moment. I quickly checked around some US stores and found Micro Center selling the 1950X for just $630, which is an absolute steal relative to its $1,000 launch price. You've been able to buy the 1950X for $750 since early June, but this is an even further discount on that CPU if you wanted that many cores. Micro Center are also selling the 18 core 1900X for $350, below the usual $450, which is again a good deal. There aren't any great deals on the 12 core 1920X at this point though, and in fact, current prices are still around $700, which makes it a bad deal compared to the 1950X. And we'll get to potential Threadripper 2 pricing later in this video. This isn't a super new story, but it is something a number of you guys have been asking me about, especially in our Patreon exclusive Discord chat. PC Perspective tore down the ASUS ROG Swift PG27UQ, which is one of the new G-Sync HDR monitors, and discovered the G-Sync module inside is a bit different to the first gen G-Sync module used in non-HDR displays. In fact, the new G-Sync HDR board uses an Altera Aria 10GX 480 FPGA alongside 3GB of DDR4 memory to process data and ensure adaptive sync works alongside HDR. The FPGA alone is a very expensive component retailing for $2,600 in low quantities through major component retailers. Even if Nvidia could get a great deal on bulk purchases of the FPGA, they're still looking at an estimated $500 for the chip alone plus additional costs for the rest of the G-Sync module and potentially licensing fees on top of that. This makes it painfully clear that a significant portion of this monitor's $2,000 retail price comes down to the G-Sync HDR module. It also seems to fit the whole narrative surrounding G-Sync HDR. Nvidia was struggling for a while to get HDR working through their G-Sync chips, hence the delays for these monitors, and it seems part of their final solution involved moving to a very expensive FPGA hardware solution. The cost of the G-Sync HDR module will also widen the price gap between G-Sync HDR and FreeSync 2 HDR monitors. 
AMD managed to successfully get FreeSync 2 HDR working without any additional chips, similar to the original FreeSync, so we could see a $500 plus price gap between similar HDR monitors depending on which adaptive sync technology they support. That does suck for NVIDIA GPU owners, but NVIDIA only has themselves to blame for going down the dedicated hardware path rather than sticking to open industry standards. Corsair has acquired Elgato Gaming, the company behind a series of popular video capture devices targeting game streamers. The terms of the deal weren't disclosed as both companies are privately owned, but the deal does see Corsair gain most of Elgato's key product lines, specifically those around video game capture and docking. Elgato will operate as a separate brand within Corsair, and while it's not clear what will happen to their current product lines, it seems that everything will likely remain the same. Elgato will be keeping their smart home appliance business under the EVE Systems name, which in itself is a large and successful division of the company, and that'll operate separately to Corsair. But smart appliances probably don't interest most gamers, and all the game-related products will now be owned by Corsair. Interesting to see Corsair expand to these sorts of devices, but they have been expanding into a lot of new areas over the last few years, and this just continues that trend. In other game streaming news, Ava Media has launched a new set of 4K HDR capable game capture devices. The key device here is the Live Game of 4K, which is a PCIe add-in card that supports 4K 60 capture in HDR and capture of up to 1440p 144 and 1080p 240, along with pass-through of all those resolutions and frame rates. Crucially, it's cheaper than Elgato's competing 4K60 Pro at $300 instead of $400, while supporting HDR capture that the Elgato equivalent does not support, so it seems like a pretty decent device there. For those that want a more portable solution, AvaMedia also launched the Live Game Ultra, which is an external USB 3.1 Gen 1 box that is limited to 4K30 non-HDR capture, although it can pass through 4K60 HDR. It also supports 1440p60 and 1080p120 capture, so half the frame rate of the PCI version. The Ultra will set you back $250, though if you have a desktop PC, the live game of 4K does seem to be the better deal as it pumps you up to you know, 60 FPS capture in 4K. If you love SD cards and just crave information on new SD technologies, this news story will be super exciting for the three people in the world that fit that criteria. The SD Association has announced the SD 7.0 specification, which paves the way for ultra-fast SD cards. It includes a new SD Express interface, which is a combination of PCIe times 1 and NVMe, allowing transfer rates up to 985 megabytes per second, significantly faster than current gen SD cards. SD 7.0 also brings a new class of cards, SD Ultra Capacity or SDUC, which supports capacities up to 128 terabytes. Current SDXC cards top out at 2 terabytes, which we're fast approaching. Crucially, faster SD Express cards will be backwards compatible with existing SD card hosts, just at lower speeds, while current SD cards will also work in newer SD Express slots. Razer has launched two keyboards with new opto-mechanical switches, the Huntsman and the Huntsman Elite. The new switches, also known as Razer Purple switches, are basically just optical switches which we've seen before in a few other keyboards. Rather than using a mechanical switch to register key presses, optical switches use an infrared sensor which is more durable and lightning fast. However, to retain the clicky nature of mechanical keyboards, Razer's opto-mechanical switches also include a tactile bump during the actuation, similar to Razer Green's with an actuation force of 45 grams and a key press registration distance of 1.5 millimeters. Both keyboards include RGB lighting, but it's the Huntsman Elite that includes the most RGB, plus additional media controls and a wrist rest. The Huntsman will set you back 149 US dollars and the Elite 199. Aussie pricing is absolutely outrageous, as with most Razer peripherals, 250 bucks for the Huntsman and a whopping $340 for the Elite. A couple of quick rumors and leaks to finish this news corner off. Firstly, we have a retail listing for the Threadripper 2990X, which might have been put up early by mistake, or it might just be full of guesses. Who really knows with these sort of rumors? In any case, European retailer Cyberport listed the 32-core Threadripper CPU as the 2990X, which we talked about in last week's news corner, alongside a 1509 euro price tag. If this listing is accurate, that would suggest a 1500 US dollar price tag for the 2990 
3090X, which would be a great price for a 32-core CPU and put a lot of pressure on Intel's HEDT lineup. Steve and I estimated during our Computex livestream that the 32-core CPU would be priced between $1,500 and $1,700, so this would be on the lower end of that. However, there are a few concerning things about the listing that throw into question its validity. The title suggests it has a 3.4 gigahertz base clock with a 4.0 gigahertz boost, but the description lists a 3.8 gigahertz clock speed. The description also claims that 180 watt TDP, even though AMD is already listed a 250 watt TDP for this processor, and both a 12 nanometer and 14 nanometer processor mentioned. When you consider these things, it's likely the listing is just a placeholder for the CPU, which means everything down to the pricing might just be a guess. We'll certainly find out in a few months. The other leak from this week is a picture of an NVIDIA GPU engineering board which was posted to Reddit. The prototyping board features 12 modules of Micron GDDR6 for 12GB in total, along with three 8-pin power connectors and what looks like an NVLink connector on the top. Plus a bunch of components are hidden behind several large active coolers and the GPU itself is missing. As Video Cards points out, this could be a GeForce product or it could be Quadro or Tesla. It's hard to really say at this point, but it is an interesting look at what NVIDIA's development boards look like before they eventually transition into a final product. That's it for this week's News Corner. Subscribe to get this segment in your inbox every Friday. Don't forget to enable the bell so you don't miss it. Consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash hardwareunboxed, and I'll catch you next time.